recruiting efforts for interns and full-time employees. If you have been here in previous conferences, you may notice that he, speak to, he spoke to us again. I mean, he spoke to us before. It's not the first time, it's probably the third or fourth time now. And the reason is the students love him so much. Uh, they love to, to hear him. He always graciously come back uh, when we invite him over. And please, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mr. Craig Andrews. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I think they're switching over to my laptop. I might need to hit function F7 or something on mine. I do. Okay. All right. So we at ConAgra Foods, we believe that technology is overrated and we've decided not to invest any further in technology. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Could you imagine if a company made that statement? What do you think shareholders would do? Bail, right? Sell. What do you think customers would do? Huh? They'd find someone else to partner with, right? Even suppliers, right? If, you, if you're not on that, if you don't have the right technology, you become a very difficult customer to work with if you don't have that technology. What about employees? You think they'd have a reaction to that? All right? So part of technology is making jobs easier. So at ConAgra, we haven't given up on technology, actually. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit across our supply chain where we tend to leverage it. Uh, let me first talk to you about ConAgra Foods. Um, you've seen some of our products out on, on display, and, and I'm glad some folks are enjoying them. Um, we uh, are actually positioned in the top 20 of food manufacturers in the world. Uh, we started in 1919 as Nebraska Consolidated Mills that was doing flour. And over the years, we've just, we, uh, we grew through acquisition, so, which is an interesting um, challenge from a technology standpoint, because a lot of the companies we bought were fairly small. So they either had some small little system or maybe something not at all. Um, but I'll talk more about that as we, we tried to consolidate it. Uh, we have an unwavering commitment. So I saw Amway's commitment to, uh, to the communities and, and uh, where they're working. Uh, we, our goal is to end child hunger in America. We've donated over 350 million pounds of food, about $50 million. Uh, we currently have a campaign going on now with Procter & Gamble. So uh, if you look for our products, there will be a push pin, and you can enter that in. And when you do that, you feed a child a meal. So I encourage you to do that. We're recognized in the Fortune 500. We're $18 billion in sales. And uh, 23 of our brands have over $100 million in sales. And these are the uh, brands that, uh, that reflect that uh, $100 million. Um, we have $2 billion brands. Anyone who hasn't heard me speak before want to take a guess out of those brands, which ones are uh, billion dollar brands? We have two. Hunt? Nope. No. Nope. Blue Bonnet? No. Nope. Peter Pan? No. Nope. Western Oil? No. Nope. Huh? Uh, Bertoli? No. Nope. Pardon? Nope. Oh, you said, oh, no, you said Marie Callender's. I'm sorry. I didn't. Admit. Marie Callender's is a billion dollar brand. They just became a billion dollar last year. But our first billion dollar brand, I don't think I've heard yet. Banquet. Yes, Banquet Chicken. So Banquet is a big seller for us. So those are our two billion dollar brands. Um, we're delivering over 13 million uh, products uh, daily. And 99% of American households have a ConAgra product uh, in their pantry or in their refrigerator or in their freezer. So uh, whoever's the 1%, could you raise your hand? <laughs> uh, we'll talk after class. Um, so we're proud of that. We're the undisputed number one or two leader in 27 different categories. So, um, so we're a pretty big player in, in some of our key areas. And. Uh, we employ about 36,000 employees worldwide in various communities. Um, corporate headquarters is in Omaha, Nebraska. 
So I'm not sure why my taskbar is showing up at the bottom, but if someone knows how, if you know how to get rid of it, sure, go ahead. So, so did anyone pick up on anything on this slide? Purdue, nice, nice. You know how long that took me to figure out the first words for every one of those sentences? I presented this earlier this week to two of my employees. One's a Purdue Cranard grad, and the other guy's from UT. And, and I asked that question, they didn't, they didn't pick up on it. I was like, seriously, I expect that from the UT guy, but the Purdue guy, it's crazy. Um, so quickly, uh, we went, uh, 14 was a very interesting year. We uh, purchased Ralcorp, which is the largest private brand producer. So if you go in and buy, you saw some of the private brands out there, if it's Kroger, Walmart, Great Value brand, those types of things. So our, our mix changed quite a bit. We are $14 billion, went to 18. To private brands became 24% of our uh, business. Um, and about, uh, oh, maybe we, maybe we should. Okay, that's fine, just leave it. It, it won't interfere with, with, it'll be fine. All right, so a little bit of the work mix. Uh, the one segment, that consumer segment, those are the things that are branded. So the Wesson Oils and the Peter Pans and Hebrew National, Crunch and Munch, Orville Redenbacher, Orville, a Purdue guy, so we're proud of that as well, that connection. Um, so it's the stuff that, uh, that you see in a lot of different uh, channels. The private brands, again, those are ones that are, are under normally the, the, uh, the grocery store or retailer's name. So the, uh, the, the top five um, retailers who are active in private brands, who are pursuing them, are growing twice as fast as the rest of the group. So it's the fastest growing part of the grocery store. Um, and for the stores, it's one of the more profitable areas. And then commercial foods. So we're supplying French fries to McDonald's and to Arby's, and we're supplying uh, um, spices to Papa John's and, and things like that, as well as other uh, commercial sectors. So um, a big part of our business as well. So enough for the commercial, now we'll talk a little bit about technology at ConAgra. Um, our overall, our ERP system is SAP. We started this about seven, eight years ago. Um, and I would say some of the technology you're gonna see in this pre presentation, some of it's just an ante. It's just, it, you just have to have it to even play in the game. Some of it gives us a competitive advantage. I told some people yesterday, unfortunately, a couple of the more Im impressive technology that give us a competitive advantage, I can't share with you guys, because then it wouldn't be a competitive advantage for very long, right? Um, so there's some really cool stuff I can't tell you about. Um, but I will tell you about some of these things here. And, and, um, and again, it's across the whole supply chain. And when we think in terms of our supply chain, we think about the planning phase, and then how do we purchase or buy? How do we then make the stuff? How do we deliver it? And how do we serve our customers? So I'm gonna talk about each of those pieces and just pull out some technology that applies to that area. So in terms of plan, and uh, uh, Josh actually talked about demand sensing. Right, so we leverage demand sensing as well. At ConAgra, it might be a little different, I'm not sure. Um, but what it is, is it's a forecasting tool that connects your demand planning to your supply planning. It looks at your open orders, it looks at recent shipments, and it looks at the demand plan forecast, and starts to make adjustment to, to your production or what you should be making. So this is done every day. So every day we're using data, that uh, we're obtaining from retailers. We're using data that we're getting from the plants on what they're producing. We're looking at inventory levels and we're tweaking our uh, forecast on a daily basis. So that's one piece of technology that we're leveraging in the plans section. Some of the benefits, we can reduce our inventories. We can serve our customers better. Uh, we can reduce the, the rush orders for raw and packed materials. We can reduce the expedited finished good product out the door because we have a better sense of what our customers are needing. On the buy piece, uh, we have some supplier collaboration, some joint planning that we're doing. And what we're doing with them is we're basically autom automatically communicating to them uh, our forecast and giving them transparency into what we're expecting to do. So this is just with some select uh, strategic partners or suppliers. Uh, in turn, that allows them to better manage their inventory, to better batch things to us, to, to, uh, to reduce cost of transportation, Material prices, both on their end and our end, can be reduced as we uh, automatically communicate um, our, our forecast to them. On the make side, uh, we, in SAP, there's a maintenance function, 
And what's cool about that is, um, is that not only does it help us with preventative maintenance and predictive maintenance, but we can actually do condition-based maintenance on equipment uh, to improve our uptime. Uh, the other thing SAP has is gold standards. So that allows us to understand our gaps from where we're actually producing to where we want to be producing. Um, and gold for us is, is perfection. We have what we call a zero loss culture at ConAgra. So how do we get to zero? Uh, and, and, um, and we know that that's something that's hard to obtain, but uh, I think it was Vince Lombardi who said, you know, if you, if you strive for perfection, you're gonna catch excellence along the way, right? So we wanna keep getting better and better. Um, we have robotics. So again, when we think in terms of technology, and again, this isn't stuff that's necessarily cutting edge, but it, it's almost an ante anymore that, that in order to improve safety and productivity in the plants, we have uh, robotics on the back end, taking finished product off, but we also have um, robotics on, um, for our fillers. So if you get a big sheet of Marie Callender's lasagna, customers were complaining that there wasn't a good even spread of sauce. Um, so we used to get like 65% coverage and then we automated it and got more sophisticated equipment, got up to 95% coverage and customer complaints went away in that area. Customized menus we use in our kitchen. So as we're making sauces or making spice blends, things like that, we have a much more sophisticated system now that uh, tells the operators uh, what they need and some that are automatically blending by themselves. So we can improve standardization and consistency. And then these three I'm gonna expand on just a little bit more, production planning with patterns optimization, LEDs, and infinity. So product PPPO is, is a model where we take inputs from the plant, we'll understand what their costs are to do changeovers, what their demand forecast looks like, what they have from a capacity standpoint. We feed it into this box and it spits out a recommendation on where should you be producing your products, how often should you be producing them, how much should you produce when you produce them, and in what order should you produce them. So it optimizes our run strategy, balancing the cost to do changeovers with the cost of working capital and finish, finish good uh, product. So that's one of our technologies that we leverage in how we make things. The other one is LEDs. This is basically just an automated data capturing system that we use on our production lines. So tied to the PLCs, so we know when, when machines are down how long are they down, uh, where are they down, uh, how much uptime do we have, what kind of defect rates are we getting at different unit ops on the line. So that drives a lot of our continuous improvement efforts when we can find out where the constraints and the bottlenecks are. So this is an example of what you might get in lead. So this is just showing, hey, for this line, uh, this is our OEE. You know, we are up and running 72% uh, of the time. These were all the places where we were incurring some downtime. I can say, okay, let me look at this labeler and try to find out what's going on there. So on the labeler, I was removing glue and I was adjusting the machine, the labels were sticking, so I can start to understand what's going on there. I say, okay, let me look at this machine adjustment. What are we doing there? Well, we're doing changeovers. I had to adjust the basket. I had to center line, I had to center belts. I had to adjust fingers. So all that is being collected um, through automation with some input from the, 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 uh, the operators as well when we start to get to really low levels so they can explain what's going on. And then you can get this kind of data out of it. Infinity is basically a st st statistical processing uh, software that we leverage at ConAgra. It helps us again analyze where there might be some opportunities um, and where we can make quality improvements. Uh, it, it allows us to get away from a lot of paper stuff that we were doing before. Um, and it also helps us with government regulations on weights. So in the food industry, it's, it's very important if you say there's 10 ounces that you're within a certain uh, upper and lower control limit on that. So Infinity can help ensure and show the government that we're actually doing that and complying with that. So it would generate automatically these run charts. It'll set your upper and lower control limits. Um, and again, we can just determine if there's something out of control and sets off a trigger on what we need to do about it. On the delivery end, we have automatic guided vehicles. Uh, we have a warehouse of 750,000 square feet with 31 AGVs in it. We have a labor management system that talk, talks about the efficiency in the warehouse and, and that area through SAP. We have advanced shipment notice where we're sending to, uh, electronically to our customers what they can expect and when they can expect. And then we leverage Oracle's uh, transportation management system. And that basically 
you create the orders, you can, can actually determine which vendor is the best vendor to use for this particular lane, for this particular mode, and all that's being done through the system. You actually tender that vendor and you get status on how things are going, and then at the end the financial piece is all taken care of within this system that says, okay, let's pay the bill, et cetera. So a little bit about OTM. And then on the serve, there's just one area I want to talk about, and that is point of sales data, which actually feeds back into the demand sensing. So by SKU or by specific product, I can find out on a uh, uh, daily basis, by store, what's going on with respect to velocity of sales. And if we think in terms of ConAgra, our plants, our distribution centers, the customer's distribution centers, and then the retail store, we want to help with revenue generation. So how do we get the optimum assortment? So Orville Redenbacher has 10 different types of popcorn. What works best at this store for this particular brand and what should we get them? So we partner with them to give them that information. We also help with merchandising and promotion. So you guys ran an ad in the paper. Afterwards, this was the uptick. Was it good? Did it not work? You did something on radio. You got a billboard, whatever it might be. And then on shelf availability, just making sure we have what they need on shelf when they need it because obviously that could be lost sales for both of us. Optimizing inventory, that's just how we collaboratively do demand planning together. Uh, and also crosses into how do we reduce our cost. So we're trying to minimize touches and miles with respect to the product. And also how do we collaborate on our supply network. Again, ma uh, maximizing batch sizes or optimizing ba batch sizes. And the last piece is just understanding the P&L within each product and how can we partner together to ensure that we're maximizing that for both of us. So that's about it. Any questions? Well, I guess we're going to do a Q&A next. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we are open for the second round QA session. Let me invite all the speakers coming back on the stage. And then, yes, so we can ask questions. Anyone have questions? We're passing this microphone to you. Anyone want to take? Oh, yeah. Thank you. You get it? Sorry. Anyone want to take the first chance to ask a question? Okay, great. No, Can you? Uh. I'm not going to make a pitch. <laughs> That's all right. Even though I can hard to resist. You know, I've always been interested in food, food supply companies. There's seven point something billion people in the world today, and they all have to eat. <clears throat> so ConAgra was one of my interests. So I'm, while you're talking, I'm doing my financial research because I want to invest. Maybe this is not appropriate, but why did the stock market, um, why did the price drop so much over the you know, last month? And now it's, it's ooching back up, it's 31, something like that. It would seem to me, you know, dividend yield is 3.2. Yep. Why wouldn't we buy ConAgra stock, right? <laughs> well, well, I think you should now. Yeah, I do too, yeah. Uh And so we were a little below expectations for the first half of the year. We go from June 1st through the next June 1st. So the first half, we were a little lighter than we expected. Uh, and then this RAL Corp integration has been a, a more challenging than we expected. Uh, you know, we said, hey, when we buy these guys, we're going to save money here, here, and do this, and do this. Uh, we've now changed a little bit of the, the timing, and, and that whole integration was just a little bit more challenging than expected. And I think that was reflected in some of our numbers. And so Wall Street saw that, but, um, but uh, you know, I feel good about where the company's going, but I think that's why there was a little dip, and now it's starting to... I, I can't yep. the buy order today. You can't? Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> closed. All right. Hi. Uh, my name is Priyanka, and I'm a first-year MBA student. And uh, my question was kind of sticking along with one of the underlying topics of our first session with the whole change management and how that works with technology. And I guess this question is um, first directed towards Josh. Uh, 
with working with farmers, with the new technologies that you have, with the drones, and then the real-time data collection, what has been one of the biggest challenges working with farmers, because it's more of external with your customers in change management, as opposed to internal as well. So what's been one of the biggest struggles in making sure the data gathered from that end is uh, accurate and consistent with what you're trying to achieve? Yeah, you're spot on. That's, that's a big challenge. And we, we are not there yet, for certain. Uh, the biggest change that I think the agriculture industry has seen, and uh, really goes for, for many industries as well, but you know, the farmer today is more likely to be someone who's gone to university and got a degree in, in agriculture in some ways and then come back to the family farm. So there's a, a generation of people now that are thinking differently. Uh, not that uh, just by virtue of age you, you can't be adopters, but it's really helping to encourage this. People understand it. They understand uh, they have a little bit more uh, maybe trust and understand the benefits of sharing that information. But that, that's really the, the biggest challenge is what are you going to do with my data? Um, and uh, it's amazing to me when I started consulting in this business 10 years ago, uh, retailers wouldn't even think about sharing their data with the distributors or with the suppliers. And now uh, we've had to use a little bit of a stick and not all carrot, uh, but uh, it's opening up and people understand that we're really wanting this information to help. But it takes it takes some some small wins, you know, to prove that. Um, it's hard to answer that question directly because it all depends on the individual. But but you're spot on that uh, that change management, particularly at the farmers are as conservative as Dow Chemical. <laughs> They're not going to change uh, very fast. Uh, it really takes uh, the, the change in leadership and, and personality uh, profile. Okay. Um, this is for a Legion. And so as you continue to kind of expand your product line and continue to grow and your database um, of just data in general grows, um, how do you plan to kind of keep everything in line and make sure that you're consistently keeping um, lead times and such down as that is a key, as you mentioned, it's a key part of your industry. So I was just wondering, you know, as your, basically as your data grows, how do you plan to uh, manage it? I mean, from an overall data standpoint, I didn't get into the uh, ERP piece of it because I thought there's plenty of talk on that. We, you know, we've, right now we've got through all my different plants, we've got different ERPs. We're a heavy user of Oracle, but we are switching to a Microsoft solution, Dyn Dynamics AX. And you know, we had to do that because when we were linked with Ingersoll RAM, we were kind of linked into their ERP, but we, as we've separated off, we, we had to make a decision to, to do something. And so we've gone back through and reevaluated what, you know, what is the right um, solution for us given the size we are and the transformation that we're underway. I'm not the expert on Dynamics I, uh, AX, but I do know that it's uh, much more flexible in terms of being able to adapt as we make changes. Um, so that is what we're doing from an overall information standpoint. Um, in terms of on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, we currently have that information available um, you know, on a real-time basis. I, we do a PSYOP process similar, similar to what Conagra, or Conagra was you know, describing in terms of our um, our demand planning. We're actually very good. We have other companies that come in and benchmark our process. Our, our forecasting accuracy is, I mean, you're never going to be 100%, but we're typically in the, the mid-90s. We continue to try to tweak that process. I mean, the ability to have a really good PSYOP process is very much linked to our ability to, to, to you know, continue with our strategy. So that's, I guess that's some of the, the, the thoughts I would have. Uh, how do how do you handle like information overload with end users on uh, the different different systems? Who are you addressing that to? Uh, everyone. <laughs> so, de yeah, internally decision decision makers who who need access to MRP systems, for example. I mean, the, you're right. Information overload's an issue, so the first uh, tactic is to try to avoid it. Um, and so there's a lot of data, to be completely honest, that just isn't being used until we have the tools uh, to uh, make it simple enough 
to actually be actionable and usable. In our particular company, um, Tableau has really uh, been something that we've adopted. Uh, it's taken a while, but uh, is gaining a lot of traction uh, because it's uh, condensing that down into a way that can be used. But we, information overload would be a waste of time and potentially even have negative impacts, so we try to avoid that at all costs. Yeah, I'll just say with Allegion being a little smaller, we don't have, you know, some of the things that I heard in the first session, we don't have those types of analytics and all that wealth of data. Um, we are very action driven, very, you know, very much um, biased for action. We want to take action based on data, so we go pull data if we don't have it. I don't see for us, information overload is not our problem. It, it's more we don't have the information we want, you know, and, and our issue is trying to, to, to get to collect data so we're, so we're making informed decisions. But maybe that's just virtue of us being a little smaller than some of the others. Yeah, for us, the, um, we really challenge people when they talk about I want data or need data or I need this report generated. We, we always challenge them on back to the business need and, and how does that connect to our purpose or what we're trying to do. Um, so that's kind of the barometer that we use as people are requesting more or wanting more or customizing data is how is it driving business results? How does it tie into our recipe for growth? So, uh, but, it, it, but it is a challenge and we have probably more data than we, we, we know what to do with. So we just keep picking the pieces that we need right now to make the de best decisions now to drive the business or improve service. Do we have time for one more question? This this is more directed towards ConAgra Foods. You said Marie Callender's just became a billion dollar uh, sale. And uh, you also said you guys had a lot of complaints about that. Now, was that your implementation? I did not say we had a lot of complaints oh, you said about you had, that. You said you had I complaints just, about the about the I dressing. said there was, a, uh, there was a complaint or two. Yeah. <laughs> complaints about the dressing. Uh, your director of, of the continuous improvement, yes. was that more of your implementation? Or did you use the technology's implementation on uh, how to better, I guess, serve the sauce? It's yeah, so yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, the um, the uh, one of the gates that we have before investing in technology or capital is: did we apply some type of continuous improvement tool or methodology across it to make sure we're addressing the right root cause? I would say in the, in the past, people would throw more assets at it, or more people at it, or or uh, or over engineer it. And it's like, did we really find out what's, what's the root cause of the problem? And those are continuous improvement tools, simple root cause analysis, eight-step FI, Six Sigma stuff. Um, so I wasn't associated with that, but knowing the, how our culture is, I'm guessing that their continuous improvement local team looked at the issue and did an analysis and found out what the, and, and ultimately got to that the fillers were not capable and we could upgrade them to something more automated and sophisticated. So good question. You're welcome. Once again, thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you very much. We will now turn the time to Dr. Shant Kumar uh, for the closing part of this event. And once again, we thank all of you for coming and attending, all the speakers and everyone that participated and helped somehow make this event possible. Dr. Shant Kumar. Um, so, uh, as I earlier said, um, uh, take, uh, undertaking anything as big as this, uh, one person cannot do. A lot of people come together uh, to help us. And uh, uh, we have a lot of student volunteers. Uh, they are not officially in the sense of being employed by the center, but on their own goodwill, come and help us. They do a great job. And so I like to recognize the student volunteers. And I like to uh, particularly ask Laura from the Operations and Supply Chain Club. Is Laura here? OK, she's at the registration there. And Brandon uh, from the, could you please stand up? So on behalf of all the student volunteers, please uh, give an applause. Uh, And uh, 
Heidi, I think uh, uh, all the industry participants would have communicated with her. She's very good. Uh, uh, I don't think she's here. This is what happens every year. I try to thank her. That's why I took the opportunity to thank her earlier. She does a great job. And I'd like to thank her. And uh, please go ahead. And our graduate assistants, they are affiliated with the centers. Uh, they do a great job. Um, without them, I don't think this could be pulled off. And, and somebody is di directing me to keep this too closer to my mouth so that <laughs> you can hear what I'm saying, and maybe I'll have to introduce her. Annabelle Fung, could you please get up? <laughs> I mean. The dean said she, da, she actually was able to accomplish in one year where many people will take five years. That's an understatement. What I can do in one year, she probably will do in one week. <laughs> so she's wonderful. Like, I mean, uh, I don't know. I cannot think if she didn't join. Granite. Actually, she came from UT Austin. She was a tenured professor there. But somehow, I told her that the weather here is great. You should move. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she fell for it. So without her, I don't think I'll be able to do anything, anything grand like this. So I'm going to ask her to come here and then talk about the GAs. Please. So this year, you can see our center is growing. We have a total of 12 graduate assistants uh, working together in teams. And uh, in Cranet, when, in every class, in every event, when we talk about our students, we talk these days a lot about launching global leaders. And we talk a lot about leadership skills. Um, one question, what goes into the leadership skills? And we can name many things, right? Being innovative, uh, being creative, taking the initiative, see the big picture, being very structured and logical. And of all these years being teaching uh, students from many batches, and then seeing the, our students go to their profession, and I look back and ask myself, who are the students uh, become the, success, the successful business people in industry? Of course, these skills that we mentioned are important, but I see the most, most important thing is take the responsibility. And this means you're willing to put more effort than many other people. This means you're willing to take the stress than many other people. Because all of our students, they have very heavy coursework. There are exams, there are group meetings, there are assignments to finish. But yet, they are taking the responsibility of the center and taking the part of their job and do an excellent job here, which is not easy. Because imagine, this, they are not full-time employees to the center. This is not the only thing they do, this is one of the hundred many things they do. So every one of them are truly outstanding in the sense that they truly take their responsibility. And it's very stressful, especially in the last two weeks for many of us. And we truly appreciate you. And next I want to recognize each individual of them. Miran, where's Miran? Yeah, stand. And he has been uh, sitting in that back little room all this time during the conference doing videotaping. And he videot videotaped yesterday's case competition too. And he's also a graduate assistant uh, TA, teaching assistant for uh, our uh, first year MBA classes. And Yesh. <laughs> and he's also doing videotaping as well as being a TA for our MBA classes this semester, yeah. And um, Ajil. <laughs> uh, he has done many things. Among the most important is our website. So he is the one keeping the consistent, you know, updated content on our website. 
Dan. Dan joined us only um, last semester, and uh, he has been um, helping in our undergraduate classes. And our student, undergraduate student and professor who's teaching the class really loved him. And this year I was trying to move him out of the, his TA ship, but the professor wouldn't let me do that. <laughs> Xing Xing. <laughs> Xing Xing is also taking the responsibility of being the teaching assistant for um, our undergraduate class. And <coughs> one thing about her is that she's very quiet. She doesn't talk much. But she's always there doing the work quietly and finishing up everything, being the last one leaving the room. Thank you. Chelsea? Of course, <laughs> everybody knows who she is. And uh, she, she is the master of ceremony. And there's a lot of effort putting into it um, because um, a lot of rehearsal a lot of things to remember. And uh, she also, uh, she was our uh, Purdue undergraduate and because of her outstanding academic performance, we recruited her to our master's program. And uh, since she joined the center, she has been you know, working tirelessly with our undergraduate student, trying to coach them up in case competitions and many other things. Peter. He's our timekeeper for today, and he was the master of ceremony for our last conference. And he has also done a lot of things with the center, which I cannot count. <laughs> and Stephanie. <laughs> and she printed all the name tags for today and yesterday's um, case competition. If you notice yesterday, on each name tag, there's time and location where you need to go to. And it's color coded to make sure that you don't get lost. That's a lot of effort. And one thing about Stephanie is that no matter how stressful you are, you saw her, you will smile. <laughs>